Welcome to our service. I'm so glad that you could join us. Uh, my name is Andre, and I'm one of the ministers here at Christ Church Tigerberg. If you're relatively new to our online services, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, please do email the church uh, and possibly sign up for our weekly news flash to know what's happening. Last week, uh, we posted an announcement video about our in-person meetings. In summary, we, would, we have decided to make our church premises available to our small connect groups to meet if they would like to in person right here at the church premises. Please do chat with your connect group leader for more information. We aim to have limited in-person Sunday services from October. We will confirm the starting date mid-September. Uh, the services will be live streamed for those unable to attend for whatever reason. And if you perhaps have expertise in live streaming, we would love to hear from you uh, as we head towards this brand new challenge. And we'll let you know the booking details as soon as possible. Would you bow your heads with me as I pray? Our Father in heaven, thank you for today, for life and health and all things. Thank you that we can meet online. Please meet with us, each one, and challenge and change us. Enable us to see something of the majesty of Christ, the enormity of our sin, and your infinite grace towards us in Jesus. Wherever we are, please speak to us today and help us. Amen. Well, we've asked Shane, one of our Connect Group leaders and one of our elders at our church, to say hi. Over to Shane. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. What the last few months have taught us is to really value Christian fellowship uh, and friendship. Uh, we've got great memories of the church camp, which took place on the last weekend before lockdown. Um, some great memories of some serious cricket matches, um, some good discussions and some great teaching from Andrew Barnes on the book of Ephesians, encouraging us to do something uh, radical for Jesus. Little did we know it would be five months later and we still haven't uh, seen each other, but hopefully we, we can see each other soon. Uh, and who knows, maybe even a church camp in the not too distant future. Uh, if you haven't already, uh, I really do encourage you to get uh, connected to a weekly group, a weekly connect group. Um, our, our group meets uh, once a week, uh, usually on Wednesday evenings, uh, and we, we do that on WhatsApp or, uh, or on Zoom. It's a great time of um, just encouraging each other in our walk with the Lord Jesus. Uh, also studying a passage of the Bible together uh, and staying in touch with each other um, and, and praying together. So if you haven't already, please do join a connect group. Uh, and we really do look forward to the time that we can see each other soon. Lots of love. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much, Shane. Hebrews chapter 10 says this. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope, that's the good news about Jesus, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now, in that passage in the Bible, we see that God commends us to meet regularly so that we can stir up and encourage each other to live out our Christian lives as best we can uh, and to keep looking forward to the day of Jesus' glorious return when all the world will see him as he truly is, our glorious King. We are so thankful for our online services and we look forward to meeting in person once again. The chief ways we are encouraged is by singing God's truth, by confessing our sins together and knowing that there is forgiveness in Christ. We are encouraged by praying together and by hearing God's voice as the Bible is explained. The Fund of Art family is going to lead us in song and this is the prayer of the song, asking God to speak to us through his word, the Bible. Good morning, church. Please join us as we sing, Speak, O Lord.
Thank you, Fundavat family. Today we're looking at another of the Ten Commandments, and I'm sure you've realized, like me, just how far short we fall of God's perfect standards of love and holiness. The psalmist says in Psalm 51, I know my transgressions and my sin is, almost, is always before me. Psalm 143 verse 2 says, Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous or is right before you. And Joel says in Joel chapter 2 verse 13, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord, for he is gracious and compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Well, friends, with those words in mind, the Bible urges us to acknowledge and confess our sins before Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, with humble and repentant hearts, that our sins may be forgiven by His infinite love and mercy in Jesus Christ our Lord. We should always humbly admit our sins before God, but especially when we meet together to give thanks for the great benefits we have received from Him, to praise and worship Him, to hear from His Holy Word, and to ask what is necessary for our souls and bodies. Therefore, let us come before the throne of our gracious God and say together, Almighty and most merciful God, We confess with shame that we have sinned against you and have disobeyed what we know to be your will. We are not worthy to be called your children. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. Forgive us our sins and cause us to live as we should, that we might serve and please you to the honour and glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of a sinner, but rather that we should turn from our sins and live. He has given authority and commandment to his ministers to declare to his people that he pardons and forgives the sins of all who truly repent and believe the gospel. Therefore, let us ask God to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, that we may please him now, and the rest of our lives may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for your giving. Uh, From our food fund over the last few weeks, we've been able to purchase more food parcels for Cross Central Church, and also buy vouchers for families in need at Christ Church Kalicha. Thank you for your ongoing giving. God was generous and is generous to us in Jesus, and he calls us to be generous as well. Please take a moment to consider your giving. Greetings everyone. I'm going to be leading us in prayer. I'd just like to read for you verses 13 and 14 from Psalm 139. Um, And it says, For you, that's God, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. So let's pray to this Father God who created us and knows us. Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for who you are, Father. We praise you and thank you for our salvation. We praise you, Lord, that our sins are forgiven through the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know, Father, that our faith comes from you, Lord. We praise you and thank you that you supply all our needs. You supply our daily needs. Heavenly Father, and so we thank you for the week past and we look forward to the week ahead. 
Heavenly Father, we think of our brothers and sisters at our partner churches, Lord. We pray for those who are going through very difficult times. With COVID lockdown, Father, those who have lost their sources of income, those who have lost family members, loved ones and friends due to the coronavirus. Father, and we know that even through this very difficult time, you are fully in control. There is nothing that takes you by surprise, Father. And we praise you and thank you that even through these difficult times, as your word says in the book of James, that we will face trials of many kinds. And we know, Lord, that it's for our molding and shaping and the testing of our faith. And so, Lord, we just want to praise you and thank you that despite the difficult times in life that we do face, we're still able to praise you knowing that you still bless us, knowing that we still have deep-seated joy, Father, because of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we can still say that we have peace, your peace, Lord. How blessed we are, Father. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for our government. During this very difficult time, the decisions that they have made and need to make, Father. We pray, Lord, that we would continue to pray for our government, for those in leadership roles. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would raise up Christian believers within our governments. We want to pray, Heavenly Father, for the medical teams, the medical staff who have been on the front line of this COVID pandemic. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for this selflessness in serving those who have suffered through the coronavirus. Heavenly Father, we thank you, knowing that your hand of protection is always on us. We thank you, Lord, for our sources of income. We thank you for family. We thank you for relationships. We thank you for friends. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that your word calls us to serve one another in love, Christ's love. And so we pray, Father, that when you provide opportunities, that we would reach out to one another to meet the needs, ultimately to serve you and to bring glory to you, Father. Heavenly Father, we also want to pray for educators we want to pray for children at schools we want to pray for our children lord heavenly father we pray for strength and wisdom for the teachers for the governing bodies we pray also lord for families who are nervous for their children being back at school we pray heavenly father that we would make wise decisions that, Lord, we would not allow ourselves to become panicked by the COVID virus, but that, Lord, we would just focus on you and keep our faith and trust firmly rooted in you, Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our ministers who are firmly rooted in sharing your gospel, your truth, Father. Thank you for the great privilege that we have of hearing your truth, that, Lord, we don't shy away from any topic, any subject, but we receive your word, your truth, without having anything added to or subtracted from your word. And so we praise you and thank you, Father. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that your word teaches that we are all equal before you, Lord. Those of us that 
are very fortunate in life financially. And those of us who are not as fortunate, Lord, we know that regardless of what our state is according to worldly standards, that we are all equal before you, Father. And so, Lord, we pray that we would have your love, Christ's love for one another, regardless of what our standing is in life. We pray, Father, that we would be eager to share the gospel, to share your word of salvation, Father. We know that we are just called to share your word, Father, and you do the opening of eyes, ears, and hearts. You do the saving work, Father. Heavenly Father, and so we praise you and thank you for your word that we will hear or have heard today. We pray that what we hear, Lord, we would be able to apply to our lives. That, Lord, your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us at our time in need. And so, Father, we praise you, we thank you. We confess, Lord, our total dependence on you. We thank you, praise you, Lord, that everything we have comes from you. That, Lord, without you, we are lost. We are entirely lost. We know, Father, that our hearts are so sinful, Lord, but that you chose in our sinful state, Lord, to reach out to us with your plan of salvation and to save us. Father, how blessed we are. We love your word, Lord. We love the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you and thank you for our right standing before you, only because of you. And so, Heavenly Father, we pray this all through your mighty name, for your glory and honour, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hi, good morning, CDT family. It's uh, great to be with you this morning. We'll be reading from the Bible uh, in Exodus 20, verse 14. And then the second part is from Matthew 5, verse 27 to verse 30. Exodus 20, verse 14 says, You shall not commit adultery. And then Matthew 5, verse 27 reads, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. This is the word of the Lord. Well, hello and welcome to our service. And let me pray for us and then we can get stuck into God's word. Won't you bow me? Lord Jesus, thank you so much for uh, your word. Thank you that you speak to us, you challenge us. Lord, as we look at this commandment that is um, so prevalent for our world and for us, we pray that you would uh, speak to us and challenge us by your spirit and word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sex is one of the most powerful gifts God has given humanity. Uh, to be enjoyed within the boundaries of marriage between one wife and one husband for life. If you want to undermine marriages and the flourishing of families, you attack sex and make it saying that it's not. Unfortunately, our world is filled with sex that fall outside of God's um, good boundaries for sex. AshleyMadison.com is an online dating service dedicated to finding and engaging in sexual relations outside of your marriage. Their slogan is, Life is short, have an affair. Its membership includes 65 million people across 53 different countries. Even in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's added 17,000 members every day. Despite that it's been much harder to meet physically together, 
Ashley Madison is seeing a surge in its membership. Another platform that we've seen an increase during lockdown is pornography. The porn industry is flourishing more than ever. There's been a surge in worldwide traffic onto porn sites across the world. One of the most popular sites saw 52 billion visits in one year, which means that it's on average 115 million visits per day. And all these sites are freely accessible and the people that are accessing them are becoming younger and younger. The seventh commandment, as you can see, is vital for our digital age. This commandment is needed if we want to save families in the sanctity of both sex and marriage, God's great gifts to humanity. I would like to say up front that no one escapes this command unscathed. No one is good when it comes to the seventh commandment. Jesus takes this command and straight to our hearts. Idolatry happens in our hearts long before it happens in the bed. It is not just what we do with our bodies, but it's what we do with our, our eyes and our minds and our thoughts. It concerns our thought life, not just our physical actions. None of us, both me and you sitting at home, none of us are innocent. This command convicts us all. We have all failed sexually and we need to be reminded that God has given us a way to be both redeemed and renewed. We can change. Our desires can be made new by the power of the Spirit and the Gospel. This command is more than just not about cheating on your spouse. It's about adhering to God's design for sex and relationships. It's about flourishing in God's good design for us. Setting our, our, our practices in the boundaries that He's given us in His Word. This command is also more than just about fleeing sexual immorality but it's about fleeing towards purity fleeing towards pleasing god fleeing towards self-control fleeing towards loving our brothers and sisters in christ fleeing towards having a different understanding about sex than our world to be holy under the law of christ is to flee from and to flee towards this command has far-reaching implications that has much more than just to do with our physical bodies but it has to do with our hearts and our minds so firstly then, what does this command tell us about God? Firstly, we learn from this command that Yahweh is faithful. He is a covenant-keeping God. He keeps His promises. The story in the book of Exodus, where these laws come from, is about God rescuing His people from Egypt and then makes a vow, a covenant, to be her husband. Israel and trade her slave rags for a wedding dress, there is a wedding ceremony at Mount Sinai. God promises to be their God and be a faithful husband to them. And they promise to be a, a faithful bride, a faithful wife to Him. They would obey Him and love Him. And within this covenant marriage, God promises to, to be a loving husband that always looks out for her. But Israel slowly forget the husband who saved her. And climbing to bed with other lovers, worshipping other gods, falling into spiritual adultery. But despite all this, God does not give up on his bride. God would not let go of his promises that he made his people. Amidst the judgment because of their sin and their rebellion, God promises to redeem and rescue her once again from her own enslavement. In Hosea 3 verse 1, Yahweh commands his prophet saying, Go again and love a woman who is loved by another and is an adulteress. Hosea is called to imitate the unconditional love and mercy of Yahweh. No matter how faithless Israel had become, God cannot bear to give, her up, give up on her. Scott Hubbard says beautifully, he says, Only in the New Testament do we find the fountain of such redeeming love. The adulteress can become a virgin only because the husband spread himself upon a cross, naked, forsaken, and wearing the thorns of her iniquity. Only at the cross can we hear the news of a fresh beginning. You were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified, all past tense, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Every dark, distorted, and, and damning stain disappears beneath this river 
of justifying grace. Wow, isn't that beautiful? Isn't that a, a wonderful truth to hold on to? God has not forgotten His people, even though they have forgotten Him. God remains faithful to His bride, the church. There is forgiveness with Jesus. That's the scandal of the cross. That's the scandal of Hosea being called to pursue his idolatrous wife. It reveals the boundless love of God in Christ towards us. It shows the extent which God, which God would go to to save rebels like us. Despite our unfaithfulness, God remains faithful. Now maybe you're sitting there and you've messed up sexually and you feel that you are too stained with your sexual sin for God to accept you and for God to forgive you. But the truth is, we have all messed up. And we aren't good enough for God. But you know the great truth is that Jesus came to die for sinners. Sinners like you and me. There is grace and forgiveness for those who turn away from sin and turn towards Jesus and trust in Him. The second thing that we learn about God is that God places a high value on our sexual dignity. The reason God has commanded us to value marriage and sex is because He had designed it and He values the dignity of every man and woman that is created in His image. Right from the beginning of creation in Genesis 2, God sets the proper boundaries for intimate relationships. This is what it says, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. When we express our sexuality outside of these boundaries, we do not love, but rather we degrade and objectify. We cheapen God's gift of sex to us. God is serious about His design for sex, that if it was broken in the Old Testament, you would either be killed or put outside of the camp because you were no longer holy. And Jesus takes this seriously as well. Listen to Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, You shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus makes the matter of sex about the heart and the mind. As much as this command is, is speaking to those who are doing the looking, it's worth noticing that G what Jesus is saying about the one being looked at, the person being seen. Jesus is saying that the person being lusted after is precious and valuable and she has sexual dignity. The sexual dignity is so precious to Jesus that it must not be violated even in the privacy of someone else's mind. Jesus continues to say, If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is far better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better for you to lose one of your members than your whole body go into hell. What Jesus is saying here, He's saying to us, Take sex and sin seriously. If you thought the death penalty was serious in the Old Testament, Jesus says that there are eternal consequences for those who continue to disregard what God has said about sex and the proper boundaries for it. Paul in 1 Corinthians 6 says something similar to what Jesus has just said. Paul says, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually moral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Sexual sin has eternal consequences. God places a high value on our sexual dignity. It really matters to God what you think about sex and how you act out and display um, these things in, in real life. Sexual dignity matters profoundly to God, not only because He created it and He created us, but because of what it points to. The reason why sexuality 
has the capacity to be profoundly damaging is because God has designed it to point to something much greater than itself. Sex and marriage is a signpost to a greater reality, a reality about the inter- intimate relationship we have with God. Ephesians 5 tells us that the the covenant of marriage reflects something far greater, our union with Jesus, our union with Christ, Paul says in Ephesians 5. So when we start redefining marriage and sexuality, really we are redefining the gospel. The gospel is at stake. Well then, what does this command tell us about ourselves well, as much as the book of Hosea shows us the loving God, the God that loves the wayward and adulterous people, it also shows us our rebellious hearts. Whereas God is the one who is faithful and always keeps his side of the covenant and promises, we are prone to breaking them. That is our natural state as sinners. Our hearts are prone to worshipping other things and, and placing our priority in someone else. We are Goma in the story of Hosea. We are spiritual adulterers. We reject God's covenant faithfulness for fleeting one night stands with idols. That, that is our natural state. We fall into the trap of believing that our sexual and romantic desires don't need to be radically transformed by Jesus. We come, when it comes to sex, we think we can plant a flag in the ground that says that this area is out of bounds to be redeemed and renewed. It becomes our private real state. We think that we can love and, and follow him on our terms, having whatever sexual relationships we desire. This is our continuous battle. This is our, this is our heart's position. And this should lead us to, this should drive us to Jesus. We need rescuing. We need God, our faithful husband, to fight for us. We need the loving lordship of Jesus to confront us, to to die daily to ourselves. We need Jesus because we we need Jesus because we have all failed. If we are brutally honest with ourselves, we have all failed sexually, and we are in great need. Of redeeming and renewing in Jesus. The reality of our sex should, the realities of our sin should drive us to, to Christ crucified. We need the cross. God's provision for sexual sin is the cross. Jesus invites us to and compassionately calls us to Himself, and He says that He will transform us by His Spirit. That is the power of the gospel. And Jesus will faithfully change our priorities and beliefs and our desires while growing our hearts all the more to willingly obey Him. Jesus claims lordship over our sexual desires and our attractions and invites us to Himself by His compassionate and compelling love. No matter what form of temptation, no matter what you failed, Personally, corporately, you can find forgiveness at the cross of Jesus. He is the one who takes all your shame and your guilt and nails it to the cross. Why don't you come to him today? He's waiting for you. And lastly, what are the practical implications of this command for us today? Like I said in the beginning, this, this command has, more to do with, has a lot more to do than just with our bodies but it has to do with our eyes and our minds and our hearts, our attitudes, our thought life. It runs deep. Jesus widens this application for us. He challenges the way we think and feel. And, um, and we need to really think about the practical implications of this. So guys, how easy, it, how easy is it for our hearts to be captured by a sight of an attractive woman who's not our wives? Often in the presence of our wives and without control. You might never have slept with another woman, but we have committed abominations in our hearts and our minds. Woman, how often do you desire to be loved and cherished by a man that is not your husband? You, your struggle for sexual purity is often an invisible struggle, but nonetheless it is real. 
You have desires, and although they are slightly different to a male's desires, they still fall outside of God's boundary for sex. Some of you might not be drawn to pornography, but escape into romantic novels and scheming, uh, romantic movies and steamy novels that encourage fantasies about being romanced by a man that is not your husband. Immodest dress and flirtatious glances and seductive body language designated to attract the male's attention is just as ungodly as the lustful thoughts that it, that it provokes. Another big issue for both men and women is um, emotional idolatry, adultery. Maybe you might never have cheated physically with another person, but you rely emotionally on someone who is not your spouse, finding your value in them, expressing your struggles and your desires and your dreams to someone who is not your husband and wife. This is a form of adultery. Whether you are married or single, sexual sin is not only a physical, physical act, but our thoughts in, in what we read and, our, and what we fantasize in, our affections, what we click on. Scripture doesn't allow us to remain satisfied with avoiding sex while entertaining women and men in our hearts, especially on our digital devices. Those who feed in their hearts with pornography and half-dressed women on Instagram may not be labeled idolaters or adulterers by the worldly standards, but have fallen short of Jesus' standard. The fight for purity is really a battle for heaven. If you are constantly yielding to lust, you are placing yourself in eternal danger. So how are we to fight this? What are some practical ways in which we can honor God with our bodies and our minds and our hearts? Well, firstly, I would say stop looking at porn and other seductive apps immediately that's on your devices. If you need to cancel your internet or drop Netflix or delete every seductive app on your phone or even ditch your smartphone, do it. And don't only do it when you feel like it because you probably won't feel like it. Jesus says that we are to be ruthless with cutting out sin in our lives. If your right eye is causing you to sin, he says, cut it out. Cut out any opportunity for lust and inappropriate desires. Paul says we should flee sexual immorality, not linger around it. Do not play around with it. Secondly, we are to confess our sins, not only to God, but to godly brothers and sisters in the church. Why don't you open yourself up to a godly man or woman in the church that you can um, share your frustrations with and your struggles and that, that they might pray for you. They might pick you up when you fall again. James exhorts us to confess our sins to one another. Why would he say that? Because lust, like any sin, thrives in the darkness. But when you confess our sins to one another, you bring it to light and you can address and deal with the issue. Why not make an appointment with Willem, our, our biblical counselor here at the church? He would love to connect with you over the Bible and a cup of coffee and see how he can help you. That is his job and he's really good at it. You are not alone in this fight for sexual purity. Thirdly, be captured by a better vision. I think this is the most important one. The gospel is both infinitely better and far more compelling than any fleeting pleasure that the world and sex can offer you. Battling sexual sin in our lives is more than an exercise in denial. It's about a fight for a greater pleasure. So with every false promise of porn and sex outside marriage, there's, a, there's true promises in God. God offers you more than anything else the world can offer you. The truth is we are freed by Christ to be free. We are cleansed by Christ to be clean. We are made holy by Christ to be holy. We need to be convicted of this if we are going to fight for purity. Lastly, I would like to challenge families and married couples to teach and demonstrate the sanctity and privilege of marriage. We have a great opportunity to witness to our neighbors and children about the beautiful gift of sex and marriage. Instead of avoiding the topic, we should be proclaiming the joys of sex within the boundaries of marriage between one man and one woman for life, remembering that sex and marriage are signposts to a greater reality, a reality of the intimate relationship we have with God. Let's not avoid the topic, 
but speak positively about it in our marriages. Well, as we close, God is straightforward when it comes to sexuality. He is not confused by it and He will not change His stance on it. He has given us wonderful gifts, gifts that work well when it flourishes in His design for them. We are called to obey Him and honor His sexual ethics. None of us, however, are innocent. This command convicts us all. We have failed sexually and we need to be reminded of God's grace anew this morning. He has given us the opportunity to be renewed and redeemed in Jesus. The gospel is a gospel of grace for sinners. Where Christ came down to die for us and to take the wrath that we deserve for our sexual sin and give us His righteousness that we might, might be seen by a holy God as pure and blameless before Him. Despite all your sin, He sees you as pure through faith in Jesus. And although that we are constantly tempted to be romanced by the world, we are to hold fast to Jesus. We need the cross because that is God's provision for our sexual sin. But can I say that doesn't allow us To make his grace cheap. We cannot continue to live how we want. And proclaim that we have heaven. No, there are consequences for rejecting the lordship of, of Christ in this area. There are consequences not only in this life, but in the life to come. So let us hold fast to the gospel of grace and see how we can seek to continually fight against sexual immorality. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we, we know that we have failed you sexually in our hearts and our minds, maybe even in, in what we've done with our, our bodies. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us, redeem and renew us to be like, like your son. Help us to fight temptation and to honor you with our bodies and our minds. And we pray us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us. I uh, hope to see you soon. Bye now. Thank you, Luan, for explaining God's word to us. We trust that uh, the message was encouraging to you. Please contact the church if you would like to chat more or like to know more about what it means to be a Christian or about Christianity in general. We, again, would love to hear from you. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, O oh, glorious day. What a great song. Thank you for joining us this morning. Let's close out with Glorious Day.
Thank you for joining us. Let me close in prayer. God bless Africa. Guard her children. Guide her leaders. And give her peace. For Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. See you next time. God bless.